As believers in Jesus, we have been adopted into God's family. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and that is something to celebrate. But being a child of God doesn't just mean that we have a new title or a new identity. It means that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Just like the tabernacle and temple housed the presence of God in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God now dwells within us. How incredible is that? And because of that, there is nowhere we can go where God is not with us. The Bible tells us in Psalm 139, 7-10, Where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Isn't that amazing? No matter where we are or what we're going through, God is always with us. And not only is He with us, but He is guiding us and holding us fast. We are never alone. But being a child of God also comes with some challenges. Just like any good parent, God wants what's best for us. And sometimes that means we will face difficult situations. We will face trials and struggles. We will face things that will test our faith. But the good news is that we don't have to face those things alone. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us and strengthening us. And we also have a community of believers that can come alongside us and support us in those times of need. As 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We are the temple of the living God, and that is something to be proud of. It's a reminder that we have a purpose and a calling on our lives, and that we are never alone in fulfilling that calling. So today, I want to encourage you to remember that you are a child of God. You are loved, you are valued, and you are never alone. No matter what you're going through, God is with you every step of the way. So hold on to that truth and let it give you the strength and courage you need to face whatever comes your way. We believe that our advantage in this world is solely related to how much of God we have in us. When we strive to know God more, our lives become more meaningful and purposeful. Let's take a look at the lives of people who walked with God versus those who didn't. There is a clear difference, right? Most of the people who made an impact in the days of the Bible were people who committed themselves to God. They did great things to the degree to which the presence of God was with them. When Jesus was leaving, He said that He wouldn't leave us as orphans. This is such an important statement because He knew the importance of His presence in our lives. That's why He sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke extensively about the Holy Spirit and gave His disciples the instruction to wait in Jerusalem for Him to come. When the Holy Spirit eventually came, there was a clear difference between the apostles who followed Jesus and the ones whom the Holy Spirit empowered. The Holy Spirit is the only reason why they were able to do what they did and they did it well. The Holy Spirit continues to empower anyone who is interested in doing phenomenal things around the world. God sent His Holy Spirit to transform our hearts and make us more Christ-like. He knew that we needed help in living a righteous life that pleases Him. Without God's help, we are unable to live the kind of life that God desires for us to have. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit works in us and helps us mature as believers and brings about the transformation of our hearts and minds. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we are children of God. So what does it mean to have God's presence in our lives? It means that we have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, guiding us and leading us. 
It means that we have a helper who intercedes for us when we don't know what to pray for. It means that we have the power to overcome sin and to live a life that pleases God. In Romans 8.14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. This means that when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, we are truly living as children of God. We are not just living for ourselves, but we are living for the glory of God. So, if you are struggling with sin, if you feel like you are not living the kind of life that God desires for you to have, remember that you are a child of God. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, and He is able to transform your life. All you have to do is surrender your life to Him and allow Him to work in you. As the Bible tells us in Titus 3, 4 through 6 states, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. When we carry the presence of God in us, we undergo a complete transformation. It's not about improving ourselves or becoming better people. It's about becoming a new creation. Just like a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly, we too become new beings. It's an incredible experience that changes not just our behavior, but our entire lives. Others will notice the change in us. People around us will see that something is different about us, even if they don't know what it is. When God's presence is in us, it's like a beacon shining brightly for others to see. So, what happens when we carry the presence of God? We experience supernatural favor. Favor is when we have loyalty in the hearts of men, and it's not something we can wish for or create ourselves. The Bible tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked, and it's rare for someone to go out of their way to benefit someone else. But with favor, people will be compelled to do things that benefit us, even if they're strangers or enemies. Secondly, we experience the manifest presence of God. This is when we are aware of God's presence and feel it in every aspect of our lives. It's an incredible feeling that brings peace, joy, and a sense of purpose. We experience supernatural guidance. When we carry God's presence, we have access to His wisdom and guidance. We are able to make better decisions and avoid mistakes because we're connected to the one who knows all things. And lastly, we experience supernatural protection. When we carry God's presence, we are protected from harm and evil. It's like having a shield that surrounds us and keeps us safe. One sign that we have received the Holy Spirit is the presence of the fruit of the Spirit. As Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. When we have the Holy Spirit, we bear fruit that reflects God's character. And that's what sets us apart from the world. Being a child of God comes with responsibilities. As we read in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the characteristics that should be evident in our lives when we allow God to work in our hearts. It's a lifelong journey and it takes time for the fruit to manifest fully in our lives. Sometimes we might find ourselves struggling to display these characteristics in our daily lives, but we can always turn to God in prayer and ask Him for help. The key is to be patient with ourselves as we grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, growth takes time, but it is worth it. So, how do we know if we are growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Well. We can go through each of them and ask ourselves if we are manifesting them in our lives. But sometimes we might not sense God's presence, and that's when we need to examine ourselves 
and see if there's anything blocking the communication between us and God. David knew this all too well. In Psalm 32, he says that his bones were wasted away because of unconfessed sin in his life. And he only found relief when he acknowledged his sin and confessed it to God. We too can find relief when we confess our sins to God and ask Him to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, if you're feeling distant from God, don't despair. Confess your sins to Him and ask for forgiveness. Remember, the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we get the presence of God? Through prayer and worship. When we worship, we're recognizing God's greatness and His presence in our lives. And when there's a constant progression of worship, the presence is felt even stronger. Worship creates an atmosphere where the presence of God is manifested. But it's not just about worshiping on Sundays. It's about being conscious of God within us at every moment, being aware of Him as if He was right in front of us. Remember, the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we can build an atmosphere of God's presence through declarations, words, prayer, and worship. Each person that has a lifestyle of prayer and worship will always be a carrier of the presence of God. But when we carry God's presence, we naturally start to avoid unholy places and activities. We realize that we can't engage in unholiness and still expect to carry the personal presence of God with us. As Peter reminds us, we are called to be holy because God is holy. We need to conduct ourselves in a way that honors God, even in the little things. Carrying God's presence within us is a privilege and a responsibility. Let us embrace it fully and seek to live a life that honors God in all that we do. God is a God of times and seasons. His word says that when he rises to bless you, no one can turn him back. He spoke to the children of Israel after a long season of suffering to rise and shine. Why? Because their light had come. It was their time. It was their season. God was turning their season around and he was telling them what would happen. Isaiah 60, 1 Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. There comes a season when God rises up to bless his faithful people. The Bible calls this a reward. Yes, maybe you haven't heard this before, but God rewards faithful people, not just in heaven on the last day, but also on earth. Abraham walked with God, and he saw God's reward even while he was still alive, before he went to heaven to witness the greater reward. Moses was faithful in all God's house, and God also rewarded him here before he was taken into glory. Joseph, the Hebrew midwives, David, Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, and many others received rewards. A time comes in our lives when God says, it's time for your blessings and no man can stop it. In fact, the Bible calls it unfaithful and unjust if God were to forget about anyone's faithfulness to him. Hebrews 6.10 God is not unjust. He will never forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Hence, it's safe to say that even if you're facing some difficulty today, if you can remain faithful, you'll soon reach your time of blessing, and no devil will be able to stop your blessing from coming to you. Now, when this season of reward and blessing starts approaching, you must be careful to learn how to read the signs so that you don't give up or turn away from your faithful work. Why is this such an important point? Because you can undermine your years of faithfulness to God and lose the attached reward if you become unfaithful and turn from following the Lord. Let's say, for instance, you've been serving the Lord with integrity for years, refusing to lie, steal, cheat, or engage in any ungodliness in your organization. 
And then, out of frustration for not having been promoted for all this time, you slip and start engaging in the things you once stood against, even though you know they don't please God. Well, here's what'll happen. God is going to forgive you when you ask for His mercy and turn to Him. But there's a chance that you may have delayed your reward even more, because time is very crucial to God. You might have fallen back before He visited the organization for your lifting. And because of what you did, you might have fallen out of favor with the instrument of the reward He was going to give you. Let me give you an instance from the Word of God. You may have heard the story of the priest who raised Samuel, Eli. This man was faithful to God, such that he was in charge of the only place where the nation came to worship and sacrifice to Jehovah. That was Shiloh, where Samuel grew up under his tutelage. However, although Eli raised Samuel to fear God, he had two sons, whom he allowed to dishonor God as priests. He never scolded or punished them for the behavior. He could have at least removed them from being priests, but instead he'd speak and then leave them to continue what they were doing. Eli was probably like many Christian parents today, who leave their children to do whatever they want, all in the name of growing up, having fun, and finding themselves. They spare the rod and let loose a generation of young people who honestly can't tell right from wrong because they were left to fend for themselves by the people God entrusted them to. You see, as a parent, you're the caretaker of that child God has given you. He is their true parent, and he would judge you for the part you refuse to play in their lives. Scriptures say that they're God's heritage, meaning they belong to him, and he trusted you with them. Let it be said that you played your part if they follow it, fine. If not, then they would face the consequences. And let it not be that you never did anything to point your kids in the right direction. I want to believe that part was for someone. Back to Eli, though. Being a good man was great. He was faithful and conducted and guided the nation. God had a personal plan to honor this man, but his actions and inactions made him miss the reward. Hear what God sent someone to tell him. 1 Samuel 2, 30-35 Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house, so that no one in it will reach old age and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength, and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what's in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. I know that this may come off as scary, but I want you to know that God is serious about you, and he wants you to be equally serious about him, too. I believe that sometimes the punishments God meets out come from a place of pain in God's heart from the fact that he's put everything in place for you and me, only to see us switch positions and throw it all away by our actions or inactions. However, the good part is this. In the same portion of scripture, God tells of the reward he'll dish out to the one whom he'll raise to serve him. That means when we serve God faithfully, he will bless and reward us. What are some of the signs to watch for so that you can start getting yourself ready for the blessings? Number one, the night seems to get darker. This is the first sign that something good's about to happen in your life. This sign can be discouraging because if you lack stamina, you may quit on God at this time. During the dark times, you may lose a job or relationships. Your life may seem to plummet downhill and you may even begin to think there's no point in living. Pressure multiplies all around you to sway your faith However, you must remember that you're God's child 
You never walk alone because your Father is with you. He has promised that through the darkest of times and through your lowest times, He will be with you to protect you until you come out on the other side. Psalms 23, 4-6 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Think about this. God wants to give you a table, and where does he put it? In the presence of your enemies. He first allows you to go through the darkest valley. At that time, evil may surround you. But don't stop trusting God. Don't compromise your integrity. Your payday is coming. If you can persevere through the dark times, you will experience your reward from God. Number two, temptations around you multiply. Another sign that your blessing's about to come your way is the temptations will start coming. The difference between this and the dark nights is that sometimes these temptations won't necessarily be sad events. They come only to make you fall from the faith or choose a different path from God's plan for you. Why? Because the enemy knows that if you choose that path, you'll miss the reward that's coming to faithful people. Faithfulness means consistently doing your duty well over time, no matter the inconveniences or pressures involved. The enemy knows this, so he tries to make the believers inconsistent. Today, many believers are jumping from one point to the other where they think it's happening. Very few people are faithfully serving God and waiting for his blessings on their lives. They have accepted the devil's lie of helping heaven help themselves. Listen, you can't play God's part. Your part's to believe and stand within the borders of God's grace and righteousness. If you stand strong, you will succeed. Lastly, number three, God will start removing some people from your life. This is very crucial. Sometimes, for the sake of what he wants to do in and through your life, God will deliberately remove people from your life. If these people remain, they will become an instrument in the hand of the enemy to either tempt or pressure you to become an unfaithful servant of God. So, to save you from this, God can cause certain altercations to take place. This way, though it might hurt you, you'll be properly positioned for the blessing to come. Don't miss these three points, my friend. They are crucial for you to receive your long-awaited testimony. Whether you're waiting for a baby like Abraham and Sarah, or waiting for a promised promotion like David, get ready for these signs to start. Why must these signs come? I'll tell you. Satan never fights what profits him. If he fights you, it means that your life and destiny is a threat to him. When he fights you, take it as a compliment. He's telling you that something good is coming. So what should you do when you see these signs? Start praising God. Rejoice. The Bible says that you'll draw water from the wells of salvation with the power of joy. Stay joyful and you'll position yourself for the best that's coming for God's faithful people. How do you know that you are God's chosen? Is it possible to have a great call upon your life without knowing it? What if I told you that God has been giving you a sign, a confirmation that you have a great call upon your life, and you didn't know before now? This message is for you, dear child of God. This message is a confirmation. Maybe you've been asking God to confirm what you've been sensing, to answer if you have a call or if you're just responding to your passions and emotions. God is saying to you today, you are my chosen one. There is a great call upon your life. It is possible for God to place his call upon someone without them knowing about it. Do you know the story of the man called Samuel in the Bible? Samuel was a miracle child. His mother had struggled to conceive for years and had prayed to God for a child. She promised to give the child back to God if he answered her prayers, which he did. Samuel was born and his mother honored her pledge. Although Samuel was growing up under the tutelage of the priest Eli, he had little to no knowledge of God's call upon his life. In fact, the first time God spoke to Samuel, 
Samuel thought he was being summoned by Eli and ran to answer after three times. Eli knew God was trying to speak to the young man. Here's how the Bible puts it, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 8-10. through 10. A third time the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Eli had to point to Samuel to God before he could know that God was the one trying to get his attention. How about the man called Jephthah? See how the Bible introduces him in Judges chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Jephthah, the Gileite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in your family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Here is a man introduced as a mighty warrior, and when you look at his background, it is nothing to write home about. He was born to a prostitute, hated and ostracized by his father's legitimate children, and became the leader of a gang of vagabonds and raiders. What would God want to do with a person such as this? I'll tell you. God wanted to do the same thing he wanted to do with Jacob the liar, Moses the murderer, Gideon the coward, Saul the persecutor, and so on. You see, the calling of God, the Bible says, is not based on your background, but rather despite your background. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29 says, Brothers and sisters, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You may have looked at yourself, and even when God tells you that you have been called to do great things, you find it hard to believe. However, let this video be the confirmation you need to have, dear believer. God has placed a great calling upon your life. It is high time you embrace it and start walking in your calling. You see, God has a special plan for your life. His thoughts for you are good and not for evil. There is something special that God has created and prepared for you. Your fulfillment in life and destiny are attached to your obedience to this plan. When God chose you for his plan for your life, many things began to happen in and around your life, both spiritually and physically. If you take a look at every one God chooses for his agenda on the earth, you will notice that each time God chose them, it turned their lives around completely. Joseph was sold into slavery. Moses was exiled from Egypt. David became a fugitive. I could go on and on with these. All of them are proof that the challenges in your life are proof that you are God's chosen one, not the opposite. The devil has lied to you enough, trying to make you believe that you are facing these challenges because you are outside God's will for you. Yes, it is possible for a person to face challenges when they walk outside God's will. Jonah is a perfect example. However, observe something. Every crisis that occurs in your life outside God's will is meant to be God's way of trying to redirect your steps back to Him, just like in the stories of Jonah and the prodigal son. The devil doesn't show you that aspect. He just tells you that you are facing these challenges because you are not useful to God, which is a lie. He tells you that you are a sinner and are God's reject. 
This is another lie. Even sinners, no matter how far gone they seem, are still being welcomed into God's family. Like a hospital, Christ is the only place where you can find the cure to your sin. Jesus still remains the cure for sin. So tell me, would the cure for sin reject the ones who need it? That doesn't make sense, does it? Well, that is because it is a lie. Now, you may look at the lives of all who have gone before us and also at yourself and think, but why does my life need to turn upside down simply because I am God's chosen? Why did each of these people start facing one problem after the other simply because they decided to serve God? Well, those things can happen for different reasons. And sometimes God himself can be the reason behind some of the challenges a person who is called faces. Why? So that he can use those challenges to prepare you for the assignment he has destined you for. Yet, no matter what, whether the devil places the challenges in your way because he wants to discourage you from taking your place in it, or God places them there because he wants to establish you before rewarding you, you need to realize that all things work together for good to every person who loves God and has been called by his purpose. So, what should you do when you face the crises of life? Praise God because they are proof of the great calling upon your life let it strengthen your conviction that you are not just another ordinary person passing through the earth. You may be struggling with one habit or another, sickness, lack, or life issue today. All of these are proof that God wants to make you a testimony. You are a living witness with a great call on your life. Hence, rather than being frustrated and depressed, start rejoicing in God. Lastly, there is good news. I reserve this for the last point so I can inspire your faith with it. When you read about all the people I mentioned earlier in this video, one thing common among them is not just the crises they faced because of their calling, but also the experiences they gained and anointing that manifested while they went through their crises. We do not always hear about or see these things, but it is true. You see. The anointing of God upon your life is the power you need to fulfill His calling upon you. The anointing of God endorses your calling. You used to look at yourself like a nobody, a failure. Someone may have looked at you and told you that you were deranged and deceiving yourself with the idea of God's calling for you. But get this, if God calls you, he will use the situations in your life to refine you and bring out the anointing he has put in you to fulfill it. Joseph's ability to interpret dreams was always present even while his brothers hated and sold him, but it could yield no positive results in his life at that time. Instead, it kept getting him into trouble. But when the time was right, the same ability made a way for him to stand before the greatest king in his day. Not only did he see the king, but his gift was the solution they needed to save their nation and other surrounding nations when the years of famine hit. What about David? Although he received the anointing to be Israel's king the day the prophet Samuel anointed him, we heard nothing special about him. However, the day came when God made him to be present at the battlefield when Goliath, the Philistine giant, was intimidating God's people, and the anointing in David responded. With an ordinary sling and a stone, David took down the giant. If you were asked who would win in that fight, you would have chosen Goliath, because on every ground he was the better man in size, skill, and experience. However, David had understood what I am sharing with you now. He believed God was with him and would give him the victory. In other words, he believed that the anointing of God to protect his name and his people was upon him and would back him up. And the rest of the story was proof that God endorsed that calling upon him. And it became clear that day that God had chosen David to lead his people. When you embrace that you have been chosen by God and follow the path he has carved out for you, you'll be giving the anointing the medium to manifest. Don't worry about who is or who isn't with you now. When the anointing finds expression, God will bring the right people around you. 
Maybe no one believes in you now. Don't worry. Take your place in God's agenda and see what happens. People will begin to see that indeed they were wrong about your convictions. If they did it with Jesus, then they are sure to do it with you. So do not let what you see around you sway you. This is God telling you with this video, I have chosen you. Start standing in your place today. I encourage you to take time to talk to God and wait on him to show you where and how he wants you to begin walking in your calling. Are you tired of feeling like you are constantly swimming against the tide? Have you been trying to control every aspect of your life only to end up exhausted and struggling to keep your head above water? It's time to let go and allow God to lead the way. Picture this, you're on a journey and you have a map in your hand. You know exactly where you're headed and how you're going to get there. But then suddenly, you find yourself on a crooked path and all your well-laid plans come crashing down. Sound familiar? In Psalms 143, verse 10, the Bible teaches us to pray for God to lead us. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. He wants us to understand that sometimes we'll experience level ground, and sometimes we'll experience the twists and turns of life. But when we allow God's spirit to lead us, everything changes. You'll experience freedom like never before, and the world won't seem so overwhelming. You'll begin to see what you like, what you're good at, and what's good for your relationship with God. And the best part? The leading of the Holy Spirit is one of many benefits of being a child of God. As Romans 8, 14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So, are you ready to give yourself fully over to God? To let go of control and allow Him to lead the way. To experience a life filled with freedom, peace, and purpose. Remember, God's Lordship over your life expresses itself in your submission to His decisions and the affairs of your life. So what are you waiting for? Allow God to lead and watch the victories roll in. And as a child of God, you have the privilege of submitting to the decisions of your heavenly Father. Because let's be real, His knowledge, His wisdom, and the understanding are beyond measure. He's not limited by time, space, or anything else. Proverbs 2, 6-9 through 9 say, For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of His saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. He knows all things, even before they happen. When you let God lead your life, you can rest assured that everything will be okay. No matter what life throws at you, God will never leave you. You have a personal connection with Him. You talk to Him daily and you feel His presence. And even when you don't feel His presence, just pray and focus on God and you will feel His love all over again. Remember when God sent Moses to lead His people out of slavery? Even when Pharaoh agreed to release the Israelites, God hardened his heart because God allowed Pharaoh to be ruled by his own stubborn nature. He let Pharaoh do what he wanted to do, be in control. But let me tell you, the desire to forge your own path is a trap. Don't fall for it. Trust in God's leading and you will experience true joy and fulfillment like never before. You see, just like Moses, God will lead you out of the bondage of the world and into a life of freedom. But hold on, it won't be a smooth ride. Just like Pharaoh, there will be obstacles and challenges, but that's where the magic happens. God will allow you to face those challenges. 
but it's all for the greater good. It's a chance for you to grow, learn, and become the person God created you to be. And when you let God lead your life, you'll experience freedom like never before. No more feeling lost, no more feeling controlled. Instead, you'll be filled with love, selflessness, and a desire to serve others. You'll be living a life that's not about you, but about God, about others, and the love you have for all of creation. There will be people who won't understand and who will judge you harshly, but trust me, it will be worth every challenge and every hardship because God will lead you to all that is good in the world and to an eternity with Him. You will face the temptation to rely solely on your own knowledge and abilities. But here's the thing, as a child of God, you have a higher calling. The Bible tells us in Psalms 139, one through four, you searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely from the beginning. That's right, folks. Our Lord and Savior knows us inside and out. And he created us to depend on him. We listen to the lies of the devil that tell us we can handle it all by ourselves. You shall not surely die, but be like God, knowing good and evil. Those words may sound appealing, but they only lead to bondage and away from the freedom that God intended for us. But let me ask you this, if your child refused to listen or learn from you, wouldn't you feel hurt? And as a school teacher, if a student constantly replied, I know what the answer is. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how I know I know I know. How much would this student truly learn? How far would they go in life compared to other students who are eager to learn and absorb new information? That's why it's crucial to understand that God is not against knowledge, especially the kind that improves the world but he's very much concerned about our dependence on our own abilities. So much so that we push him to the sidelines. So, my friends, let's not fall into the trap of thinking we have all the answers. Let's humbly depend on the one who created us and loves us unconditionally. Together, let's walk in the light of his wisdom and guidance. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. Embrace your identity and let your light shine bright, my friends. May the peace and love of our Lord be with you always. Trust in his knowledge and understanding. Seek his guidance and wisdom in our lives. And remember, as children of God, we are never alone. He is always with us, always guiding us, and always loving us. Have you ever met a child who refuses to listen to his parents, teachers, or anyone who tries to guide him? He just nods his head and walks away, completely ignoring what they're trying to tell him. Well, believe it or not, this child is a reflection of many of us as children of God. We say we love God and we want to please him, but when it comes down to it, we want to have our way every chance we have. We don't know what it means to have God lead us. And when things don't go as expected, we blame God for not stepping in to help us. But have you read the Bible lately? It's very clear that a way may seem right, but it can still be a deadly trap meant to destroy you. Proverbs 14.12 There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Think about it. How many times have you tried to do something or say something that at first seemed safe and profitable, only for things to fall apart once you took action? That's when God comes in and says, let me lead you. He wants us to give up control and trust that he knows best. It can be difficult to do, but the changes you'll see in your life will be worth it. Proverbs 3, five through six. 
It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. God wants to guide us and lead us on the path to success, but we have to be willing to let go of our fears and our worries and trust that He knows what's best for us. So, my dear friends, let's not be like that child who refuses to listen and learn. Let's be like the wise man who seeks knowledge and wisdom, who trusts in the Lord and acknowledges Him in all His ways. Remember, knowledge is transitory, but God is eternal and up to date. He will never steer us wrong. So let go and let God lead you. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You see, when we acknowledge that God is in control, we can rest in Him and not worry about the trials and difficulties that come our way. When we spend quality time with God in prayer, He endures us with His power, with boldness, and with the ability to speak His word with confidence. And when we do that, He stretches out His hand, confirming His word with signs and wonders. But it all starts with letting go and letting God. That's the key to glorious living. And even more importantly, it's the key to an eternity with God. By letting God into your daily routine, you'll find that He will help you solve your problems in ways you never thought possible. Now I know what you're thinking. You've got plans and dreams and you want to make them a reality. But here's the thing. We can't just put a plan together and expect God to bless it if we didn't seek His will in the first place. God doesn't want to be the last resort, but the one you turn to on every step. Before you start building, seek Him and His plan. Don't try to pull off your own ideas and expect God to follow you. Instead, seek God in His plan and you'll find that your life will take on a whole new meaning. And here's the best part. No matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus understands. He understands all your pain, all your hurt, all your loss, all your temptations, and all your struggles. And because God created you and Christ has made you acceptable, don't worry about what others say about you. God is with you and He is for you. He will never leave you. So, my friends, when life gets tough, Remember that God is the solution to all of your problems. He is an awesome God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And that, my friends, is the truth. So let's stand tall, shoulders back, and face the world with confidence, knowing that we serve an awesome God who is always with us, leading us, and guiding us every step of the way. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. And that, my friends, is a truth that will change your life forever. Have you ever tried to talk to someone about your faith and was met with outright rejection and possibly hatred? How did you handle the situation? Why is this common among those closer to you to reject you or mock your fate? Today, even with the advancement in technology and ease of broadcast and communication, never has the Christian faith been this hated as we see all over the world. You may have noticed this, or maybe not. However, Christianity suffers great hate and rejection now more than ever. And not just where you are, but all over the world. In this video, God wants to show you some reasons why people reject you and hate your faith. I encourage you to receive these words with an open heart as we look at things from the Word of God. You see, the Bible says that the more we look at the Word and glory of God, we are transformed into His image. In other words, the Word of God is like a mirror. When we open ourselves to be projected by it, it shows us the image God wants us to become. For instance, when you turn to the Word of God, you will find out that the real you in Christ isn't a thief, an addict, a quarrelsome neighbor, or a rebellious child. 
And the more you look into it, prayerfully trusting God to work that personality of Christ out in your life, the more you become like it. James chapter 1, verse 25 puts it this way, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. What is that perfect law of liberty? It is everything the Bible says about who and what we are in Christ now that we are born again. So, back to our question. Why do people hate you and reject your faith? I don't know about you, but I have met believers before whom, if I didn't know better, would make it possible for me to ever become a Christian. Some of them I know and some I don't know. As I grew older in the faith, I began to spend time on this question. Why do people reject many Christians? And why are many of us hated? And the Lord began to teach me many things from His Word responsible for this. Jesus said, you, me, and every other believer out there in the world are the light and salt of the earth. Embedded in every believer is the hope the world needs today. Let that sink in. Within every Christian lies completeness and inspiration for true living. The saint has righteousness, which is victory over sin and guilt. He also has peace, which is calmness and steadiness in the midst of chaos, which the average person cannot understand from the standpoint of this world. And lastly, the saint has joy in the Holy Ghost, which is the victorious confidence and delight in the glory of God and the eternal hope that we have in Christ. Paul tells us that these three is the kingdom of God, which is worth more than food or earthly possessions, because they are eternal. Anyone who has these three, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, has the kingdom of God living in them. Yet, the sad thing about all of this is that a person can have all of these and yet still be rejected and hated by everyone around him or her. Now, let me quickly say this. People can reject you and hate your faith for many reasons that have nothing to do with you. For example, people can hate you because of their own spiritual blindness to the truth that you preach and the hardness or unreadiness of their heart to accept salvation. This is the reason many saints are persecuted in most parts of the world. Another reason they may hate your faith and reject you may be due to the light that your presence brings. Let me explain. When a Christian is in a place surrounded by individuals who practice ungodliness, the light of the child of God automatically rises against it. Sometimes, he or she may speak up against an injustice reigning in a workplace or organization. He or she may rise up against embezzlement of resources, stealing, forgery, and other things, which are the norm among them. Now, these guys are bound to hate you for this. Why? because your light doesn't allow their darkness to reign or influence you. So, they may mock you, hate you, and even make things difficult for you because of what you stand for. Jesus told us all about these while he walked with his disciples. He taught them to be prepared because they will face troubles because of his name, but that they should not give up because if they keep standing for him without denying him or keeping quiet to let darkness win, he will reward them. All of these people may think they know what they are doing, but the truth is that they do not. They are under the influence of the devil that gives them a false picture of the truth and of you, the messenger of Jesus Christ. Two verses of scriptures talk about this predicament of theirs. First in John chapter 12, verse 40, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts, nor turn and I would heal them. Second is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, they hate you and reject your message. If you are in this situation, there is no need to worry whether you aren't doing anything right or if something is wrong with you. The problem is not you, but them. However, before you rest, it is important to scan yourself first to know if you are the reason why they hate you. 
I will share two other reasons why the world rejects you and hates your faith. The first reason people may reject you and hate your faith may be because your life does not reveal the light you profess. What do I mean by this? Remember the Bible says you are light and salt, right? However, what did Jesus say about a salt that loses its sweetness? Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When we look at these verses, we may only see from the angle of a Christian who displeases God and gets out of the faith. However, it is more than that. You see, we can also deduce that no one appreciates or wants to have anything to do with salt that does not serve its purpose anymore. They will reject it, refuse to call it salt, and eventually throw it away. This may begin to make more sense to you now. When a Christian professes one thing but lives another, no one would take you serious. Rather, they would call you a hypocrite. This is why Jesus laid so much emphasis on bearing fruit. You see, through faith, you are saved in Christ and your sins are forgiven through the blood, as the scripture said. However, in order for you to have an effective testimony in your Christian journey among men, a life that reflects eternal life is necessary. You cannot be living like them and then try to make them accept your message of a life they don't even see in you, even if it is there. This is why you must surrender your life completely to the working of the Holy Spirit. This way, we will work out Christ in you in such a way that people can see your lifestyle and know that God truly exists and works through people. I remember the story of a child once in a Sunday school class being taught about Jesus was asked if she'd ever seen Jesus. And the little girl said, yes, she had seen him. In curiosity, the teacher asked her, where did she see Jesus? And she smiled and said that Jesus lived in her building. He was her next door neighbor. When the teacher kept asking, she said this particular neighbor of theirs had all the qualities that the teacher had mentioned Jesus had. And she believed he was the one she was talking about. Although this was a child, she could see something special in the young man who had made up his mind to be an example of Jesus. This should also be your testimony. I know it is challenging to be different in the world today where everyone wants to be seen, heard, and accepted. However, you need to understand that God, the one who matters most, both loves and accepts you. And you owe Jesus the life you now have. You are no longer in charge of it, but Him. And one of the easiest ways to spread his love to the world is by being his vessel and practicing what the Bible says. Someone once said, preach the gospel at all times, use words only when necessary, meaning that the first method of demonstrating our message of Christ is not through words, but through our lifestyle. This agrees with what Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When you live according to the commands of the Word of God, even if the world hates you, they will respect you. You have more chance of saving more souls with the life surrendered to Jesus than with one living like the souls you are out to share the gospel with. And then secondly, the reason you may be rejected and hated is because you may be preaching a different message than the message of the gospel. What is the message of the gospel we have been given to preach? Is it of heaven or hell? Is it the message of perfection? Or is it the message of judgment and condemnation? The Apostle Paul wrote that now that we have been saved, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, meaning that we have a new job of restoring the world back to a relationship with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. 
We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, what is our message here? It is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16. Being one of the most popular verses of the scripture, many people don't even see what it truly stands for. You see, the message of the gospel is not that people should clean themselves up and come to God, they can't. The message of the gospel is not that every unbeliever will go to hell when they die. Is it the truth? Yes. But it is not the central message of the gospel you have been asked to preach. The message you've been asked to preach is that Jesus has paid the price and now he offers everyone forgiveness of sins and a fresh new start with an eternal hope with God in heaven. What is the key to this? Faith. Whoever would put their faith on Jesus will be saved. That is God's promise. That is why it is called the free gift of righteousness. You didn't work for it, you just receive it through faith. When you judge everyone, condemn everything, insult people, all in the name of trying to share your faith with them, you contradict the very purpose of your message, which is to shine the light in a dark world and save the lost. Hence, though the world can hate you because of the blindness of their hearts, you must make sure you have checked these two boxes. Are you living like a Christian? And are you talking about Jesus and the saving grace he offers anyone who comes to him? If Jesus becomes your sinner, like moth to a lamp, you can attract the wounded, broken and lost to you. Why? Because that is who Jesus is and you are his ambassador.